Oh, and welcome again to another edition of Indie Apocalypse Radio. I'm your host, Andrew, and I've hit all the buttons, smashed all the things, got everything out of got everything done. We're here, Indie Apocalypse Radio, which is of course your uh your what what what, what do I call this thing? Your you're you're kind of like your post con somewhere between an interview and a post con hangout, your casual space for game developers and other artists just to hang out for a moment. Um, I'm of course Andrew, the host, uh, creator, etc. of Indie Apocalypse monthly anthology, all that stuff. Um, that all aside, I don't have any preamble today. I don't feel like you know my one preamble is if you're interested in those Indie Apocalypse tapes, a good reminder is that um, I am a person who makes them all by hand. Do not order them two days if you need them in like two days on a hard deadline. It's exhausting. Um, but all that aside. We are here with our first guest, unrelated to the zine. We're getting more into guests unrelated <laughs> to Indie Apocalypse, it's branching out, um, but not not so unrelated that they're not in game development. Uh, um, for you, for you may know her uh, from the development of the the the. I don't want to say soon to be released, but eventually to be released <laughs> game. Yes, the Crimson Diamond, um, Julian Minamata. Hello, Julia. Hi. I was Hello. Like, now, important question, because this is a question I forgot to ask in the preamble. Mm-hmm. Did I hit the emphasis right on the last name? Oh, it's fine. Minamata. It's fine. Okay, yeah, good, it's, good. It's, that's, it's all good. That's the one thing I always worry about with, like, longer last names. is like, I, I know all the letters and all the syllables, <laughs> now, but, but I got to make sure I hit the emphasis correctly. Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Oh, perfect. Um, well, welcome I don't even show. pronounce my own, I don't even pronounce my own last name correctly anyway. Like, I mean, if I was going to pronounce it like as a Japanese person would do it, it would like I don't they wouldn't say Minamata, but I just do. It's fine. Yes, that so. that was that's part of my uh, <laughs> yeah my yeah. brain stopped as I've been going mm-hmm. through like kanji learning apps for probably too long, so I can sneak my way into the Japanese indie scene. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a cool scene. Um, it's it's another hub of game development. Um, oh, I didn't. I don't even know about that. I am I am loosely aware of it, but you know, bruh, language barriers and all. Also, I just want to. I like comics, and what if I could just read indie comics that people don't translate? <laughs> That'd be cool. Um, yes, that that. I also was doing kanji. I've said Anki on my phone for a while. I do. I still do Duolingo. I've got a wonderful streak that I'm still babysitting. I only do like one lesson a day, but I yeah. feel like it's still better than nothing. I I try I, I I tried a little bit of that. I was doing a little bit of that for Spanish. I, I do want to brush up again on that because I'm like fairly good. I like I'm functionally good at it. Um, but we're we're not here talking about languages. At least at least not right <laughs> away. Uh, no no no. We'll, we'll get there. We'll get yes, there. Yes yes. That's the, the you know the inevitability of aforementioned postcon hangout where you're like oh yeah we're talking about the show talking about the show and then we no longer talk about the show. We're just talking about. Like, who cares about the business? Let's talk about what is the best uh, street food you can get around the convention center. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But we're here to, but now we're at the start of it. So if people are unfamiliar uh, with the Crimson Diamond, uh, what is the Crimson Diamond? The Crimson Diamond is a cozy mystery adventure game. And you interact with it with a text parser, which is you type into your keyboard and if you want to open a door you have to type open door if you want to ask someone about ducks you you type ask kimmy about ducks and you that's how you interact with the world and it's it's kind of an old fashioned type of way of interacting with games yeah that kind of yeah it kind of fell out of favor because um the the dictionary was extremely selective and specific about what you could do um so it was, it was always tough to, to play them but nowadays we have the benefit of all this technology and resources that you don't need to just have one magic word that you have to make the player guess you can have right. synonyms you can do all kinds of stuff so um i i've been making this game with this idea that i would love that if text parsers could be something that we revisit and can enjoy again and and make and they're easier to enjoy now i think yeah, yeah, there is right. Uh, what do you, what are you making it in? If I can ask. Yes. Yeah, I'm making it in Adventure Game Studio. Uh, yes. so it is an adventure game. The Telltale yes, sign. So you're, you're familiar. Yeah. Um, that's what I started so it, in. <laughs> oh, fantastic! Fantastic. Okay, we have that's something else we have to talk about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> down the line. Uh, so the game looks like you know an old Sierra adventure game. It's got the same EGA color palette, like the the 16 color default EGA color palette. The, the musician that I've got on, Dan Policar, he's using a genuine Roland MT32 to compose the MIDI music for it. 
and it, it was important to me to kind of recall that old that old golden age timey of um the the games that I enjoyed growing up. Yeah. But at the same time, I do want to make them like easier than a Sierra game to play and something that someone who's never played that type of game before can enjoy. Yeah, because there is like uh, you know, if you look at the, the draconian idea of game development as infinite as uh, linear progress, text parsers are a <laughs> thing of the past. But but they're like a, they're a they're a flavor of themselves, like kind of yeah. learning to understand them and learning to like, you know, for lack of a better word, parse them. Uh, I th- there's there's so much to do about that particular era of gaming where. Basically, every decision that was made was due to technical limitation. Yeah, and that that includes like the color palette. So this sixteen, you know, color color palette that I'm using, it was done because they didn't have like enough memory to do anything else really. And the artists at the time like really hated the color palette because they all they saw was this limitation. But for me, it's just a style. Right. It's some some it's something I look at and I, I'm getting something from it. Besides, that this is all we could do. Well, we could definitely do more, infinitely more nowadays. But this is still what I like to do. I like the look of it. I like the way it makes me feel. And I'm not alone in that. And that's the part that makes me really excited. Yeah, there's a, there's a strong draw to the kind of you know, the harsh colors you get out of doing out of using those when you're restricted to 16 colors. You know, there's there's most people don't have a lot of you know bright uh, green and pink furniture. Um, around mm-hmm. their house but when you're 16... yeah it really yeah go sorry oh yeah it forces it forces you to be creative and what i love also is is so i, I stream on tuesdays on twitch actually yeah. a underscore maple mystery but um i i what i do so I, I i do like game art development on there but i usually i usually end the night off with playing an old ega adventure game from back in the day right um stuff you know stuff that people know about like loom and stuff but also people things people don't know about like denarius Everitius sextus and um like high seas homicide and stuff like that where it's the same color palette but people are solving the same problems with with, you know how to make a game look good or how to make a game like playable and understandable with the same color palette and it's so educational because there's so many different ways of doing it and you think it's restrictive but it's really not yeah no yeah you there's like amazing work you can just like you know look up some of the like uh, those EGA or like those ZX Spectrum like portraits. And it's yeah. like, oh, they this is like t- four colors on this face, but this face is doing so much work with yeah. with with just this t- this extensively limited color palette. And it's like, oh, wait. Also, the human mind is like better at parsing images mm-hmm. than I think we give it credit for. You know, it also fills in those gaps. Yeah, right. And that's what excites me the most. Like, I don't I don't care really. I'm not that interested in super realistic 3D art and stuff. Yeah. I'm most I'm most excited by like low resolution, limited color palette art that yeah, like people can make that it might it's not realistic at all, but it it's basically like your mind fills in the gaps like when you're reading a book. Um that's what it gets me excited. Right, right. Books they don't have any graphics at all. <laughs> Most well, most of them don't. Yeah, right. and sure. and no one is saying, well, you know, let's. Uh, that was like in the past, right? Like we're past that now. We we have pictures and video and m- moving things. No, th- there is a virtue to that format that I feel like I want to keep refining, and it has nothing to do with well, that's all we could do at the time. No, there's something there that is that is above the limitation. And right, that's right. What I love. Yeah, everyone's like, you know, all those developers are probably like, oh, I could, I wish I could do more, but they weren't thinking, oh, but the games are making are bad because I can't do more. <laughs> You know, yeah. You're like, oh no, no, these games are still like good games that people, that these developers were proud to have made. They're just, uh, they wish they had eight more, eight more colors at least. <laughs> just, just it's like, like, of, in, like yeah. indiness of being an indie person. The, the idea is also that making these games that are like low resolution, low, low, low color palette and everything. It's, it's within reach of like one person or right. a small team to do. You don't need like, you know, thousands of people and thousands and thousands of man hours over, you know, six years or something and millions and millions of dollars to make something that's interesting and a story that's engaging. And I like that too. I think that's really magical. Yeah. I, I like, I'm, I'm not a, a, a game development, you know, I'm not working in the accounting industry of the game development, but I would bet that ballooning budgets are primarily uh, correlated to graphics, you know, <laughs> there's like, I think that- and also just like what happens when you have a large team, you have to start paying people to manage the other people. And, all, yeah. you know, there's so, so much extra that happens on top of that. That is not just creating the thing. It's a, it's a weird thing where it's, if we all just had, what if we just scaled back two console generations and suddenly mm-hmm. everything is like way more affordable for everybody? Yeah. 
I mean, if we could all just agree to that, I think yeah. that the world would be a better place. Maybe Listen, maybe I don't get to see all of the pores on my character's faces, <laughs> but do I miss them? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it is, now, you mentioned uh, playing um, just kind of like games of the era of... Mm -hmm. uh, I did peek around your YouTube channel, but I could like, yeah, let me, I was like, let me look around at some of this, some, like get prepped for the show. Like, oh, wait a minute. I don't have, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm like Twitch streaming, right. Those people Twitch stream for like four hours every day. I was like, I don't know if I have, I don't know if I have, uh, uh, 24 hours of video time to check things out. Um, but you do, you do play a lot of like, I was like, oh, I like that. Like, I don't recognize a lot of these names of these mm -hmm. games. Cause I'm, that was like, uh, before my era of owning a PC, what are what are your what are some of your favorites of the? Um, I would say you know the non canonical sort of like outside of like the regular Sierra King's Quest style uh, milieu of games. There, there are a few like I, I recent I I I recently played and I, I mentioned uh, Denarius Everestia Sextus, which was a game made by a company called Thorsoft of Letchworth. And they're, they were British. The thing is, though, I, I say company, but what it was was a 16-year-old and her 14-year-old brother who spent two years making a game based on, like, Roman comedies. <laughs> <laughs> and it was amazing. So their dad bought the compiler, so he got a producer credit on that. Right. And so it, looked, it looks like three people have made it. But, yeah, it was like two teenagers made it over two years. And it's really good. It, it has, a, like, a very unique UI. Um, the, the mouse actually just moves the character around like it's the cursor. Um, huh. around on the and it has a text parser but it also has contextual menus like i cannot they use turbo pascal to, to to program this and it's the most impressive one of the most impressive things i've ever seen especially considering the age of the people making it and the fact that they did finish it at that age too right um, I, I i just there was a great i didn't have to um it, there were no unfair puzzles there were no unfair mazes i was able to finish it from beginning to end with absolutely no hints which is not something I'm used to, you know, considering Sierra games and the way they can be unfair. It was much more fair than a Sierra game, in fact. Yeah. And um, the, the best part about it is um, Marnano Thurman, uh, the, um, one of the developers, found me on Facebook and actually dropped in on my Twitch channel, was answering questions and explaining a lot of the jokes that are in, are in the game because they're kind of going over my head a little bit. Yeah. And there are also a lot of cultural references and stuff like specific to that era and that, that uh, specific region of the UK as well. Um, so that was fun too. Yeah, that that kind of thing is the stuff I live for. Um, so that's that's one example. Yeah, no, um, I, I am I am <laughs> I am like favoriting these sorts of things and like, I like oh wait, I am I am there... I am keeping track of these sorts of things because it is like, uh, uh, I've talked about it too much on the show of games kind of are bad at recording history as a medium. You know, I mean, I guess all art is kind of like that, where it's you know. How of all the art produced in the year, how how much of it perseveres past that year or past ten years? But yeah. I will say, with, like with with PC games, and yeah. there's a huge community of like DOS DOS gamers who are really intent on preserving the stuff that we have. And and I mean, I like, guess consoles have this as a much bigger problem, of course, right. with the hardware and everything. But um, yeah, stuff like it's amazing that I could, I found an Aries Everest Sextus just like on one of those you know abandoned wear sites or something like that. It's definitely not commercially available. But there's there there are and there are lots of Twitch streamers who actually do play all these obscure things that, that no one's ever heard of, and then they become more popular and more seen. And it they you could still like there's DOSBox, there's Scum VM, there's these people who are just volunteering their time yeah. to pre like making these games, not only just preserving them, but making them playable to just any just about anybody. Yeah, I'm looking um, right now, and it looks like if I mean I found it on Internet Archive, and I bet I could just play this thing in browser. It looks like yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I'm com I'm always completely amazed by the, the community, like the retro gaming community. There's also a community of people who who still do mods for games. Yeah. Um, old, old DOS games, which I love too. Like there's there's a game called Cosmos Cosmic Adventure, which was an Apogee platformer, and it's it's got like this little green alien kid. And I personally w don't care for that particular sprite for the 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 alien kid. Yeah. And these couple couple Twitch streamers like modded Cosmo to put him in clothes, like like a t-shirt and jeans and sneakers and everything. Um. Which I love, and now I'm now I'm now also going to be making sprite like every sprite in the game is the goal is to put pants on every sprite in the game, no matter how ridiculous it is, and it's just yeah, it's amazing that there are there are these re not only 
are the resources, but there are like, continually updated resources and people who are making like levels for stuff from yeah. games that are like 30 years old. Right. Right. And not even, not just like the, the obvious, you know, you know, people that people still making Mario world levels, but people, <laughs> you know, uh, adjusting all DOS games that I bet people would, you know, how many people are out there going, ah, yes, Cosmos cosmic adventure. Uh, I know it, I know it too well. Yeah. You, like doom like john romero is like yeah. coming he, he he releases these wads of like his some like new doom levels that he's he's designed on like floppy disks yeah there's there there's so much and you know it's like you said earlier um it, because it's this lo-fi it's you know you don't have to <laughs> spend 30 hours mm -hmm. you making giant meshes it's like <laughs> cosmos probably what like 32 by 64 <laughs> if i'm being generous yeah it's something like that so yeah i've put pants on crates i put pants on spitting plants and each of them take you know even if they're animated they they probably take me like they less than an hour to just do one of these things right and that's the beauty of it too yeah yeah it, it, it's uh, it's all extremely small scale and but it all it all shines through like you know people mm -hmm. you know what it is by looking at it mm -hmm. i'm always i'm always fascinated i have one of those um uh i forget what it was called i think it's called ff dot maybe it's like an it's like a Final Fantasy art book, and they have on some of the pages they mm -hmm. have those original Final Fantasy one sprites, but like blown up and like on a grid. <laughs> and I think they might even have like the color key next yes. to them. Yes, I see. I see. I'm looking at the images right now. So it's like, They're if you want to recreate the warrior, here is how you do it exactly. That's that's yeah. That's another thing I love about it is that people it, it's easier to modify stuff. So if people do want to modify, like yeah, like it's it, you can change the color, you can add this, you can add that, and it still holds together really well. Right, and it's it's such a specific sort of era of of design, and I feel like you know more people are you know increasingly maybe coming back to that. You know, I think that's in the indie space where they're like, I don't have forty million dollars, I have uh, no million dollars. And I have my free time. And and also the tools that are required to make those changes. You know, if you have any pixel editing app, some of them are free. A lot of them are free. A lot of them are cheap. Yeah. You can, it's like you could do that. You There are pixel art apps you ha can have on your phone even. And just, you could just make a little sprite on your phone and then you can put it in your game. And, you know, these 3D games, like you need like what Unity or you need these software licenses and you need a, like a big beefy computer to, to render things. Um, like leaving aside the time, there's also an expense. Yes, yes, that is. I've talked. To, I remember talking to a dev on here earlier. He's like, uh, part of his 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 uh, proclivities to retro styles. He's like, this is what my computer can make. Um, yeah. Like mm -hmm. my computer can do two D art. Uh, my computer can't run, you know, Blender well or whatever. Because mm -hmm. I think so basically. Oh, sorry, go on. No, I was saying is I think we people usually in like a very uh, U.S.-centric world often tend to forget that computers are very expensive. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, they're very expensive, especially thing, you know, things to do 3D in. And it's not just one skill set of pixel art. Like when, if you want to do 3D, like you have to know how to rig and light and do textures. And it, yeah, there's a, there's a huge learning curve you know, if you've not, if you want to, to learn something on your own, um, like with pixel art and low-res art. It, this it's so much more easy to approach and less intimidating right right because it, often it can transfer from just like a different skill set you already have you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. you can... yeah which is what for me that's what it was i was a freelance illustrator for 10 years before yeah. i segued into pixel art and it was a very natural transition for me for sure right all you all, the, the hardest thing is probably learning a little bit of animation along the way exactly like and the programming of course with adventure game studio sure, some, right. like, some of the programming but yeah it was it was it's not like okay well i have to go to school for five years to like learn the 50 different skills i would need to do to to make a 3d a realistic type of a game no it just it's a matter of like yeah looking at a book like this final fantasy ff dot book and saying okay i see how how they're doing this and what the techniques are and i can recreate something that can kind of look like that right and like and they were like the, the cool I think the cool thing with that book specifically is like they show like Amino's like original you know hyper detailed mm. <laughs> portraits then they show the little pixel guy next to it and you're like oh they did a really good job of translating mm -hmm. this and it's like mm -hmm. oh yeah you can take like these these lush uh, stylized animations and turn them into or not animations uh, illustrations rather and turn them into little 64 by 64 guys yes and still yeah. convey all the ideas 
Yes, exactly. But but yeah, no, especially and like you know the you mentioned we mentioned a couple of times Adventure Game Studio. If people are unfamiliar, mm-hmm. it's, you know it's a. I feel like how long has that thing been around? I feel like it's almost been around since the nineties. I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if it has. Yeah, twenty five years now. I think. <laughs> yeah, my God. It's, so yeah, long. but it still it, has vibrant community and c- continues to be updated. Three point six came out like this year. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. Yeah, and it, and the thing is, it's like uh, when when I talk about engines, I talk about you know, hey, sometimes it's like super beneficial to like not have one engine and just to like use specialized engines if that's what you want to make, you know. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm sure you could make the Crimson Diamond in, in like another two D engine like Game Maker or Godot, but like you're making an adventure game. Why not use the the engine that does ninety percent of the work for you? Well, exactly, and it's it's perfect, especially for someone like me who's who's self taught with the programming stuff. So having an in, like a, a this this design environment, whatever it's called, um, to, that's already set up with like rooms and characters and all that, like that's something I don't have to visualize myself. It's all there. The saving and loading functions are there. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It, it, yeah, it does so much of that. Like the I I am I've been envious of like its text, uh, like its mm-hmm. built in text and like dialogue system forever. It's just. Oh, you can just make branching text and just like it types exactly how you want it. And I've been envious of it for so long and chasing it. I'm so happy when there are tools that make it easier for people to make stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It it saves you so much time of like, you know, how much time would would this game have taken you if you had to, you know, build it in Unity, you know, or or would you even get this far? Would you just like, oh, I, I this is a bridge too far, you know? It's one of those those things to think about. But, yeah, no, yeah. And it has, like, you know, the forums. I'm on the AGS site, and it's like the forums <laughs> are getting posted as of, like, an hour ago. Yeah. So it's wonderful to, to, to see it still around and people still are using it to make games still and, um, like, getting helping each other. I've, I've gotten so much help from the AGS community when I've been stuck. Yeah. Um, it's so great. And uh, it's open source. It's free. Anyone can do anything with it if they want. Yeah. I had a, I had a guest on uh, I don't know, a couple of months ago, and she had also made their games in Adventure Game Studio. And it's just like, it just is just, it's, it's a useful, like, if you were making an adventure game, that's where it is. That's, that's where they live. <laughs> but yep. all, the, all that aside, I'm going to close, close that and stay focused on the. Um... Oh. Actually, actually, mm-hmm. Julia, we are actually approaching the end of our twenty-minute se- of our, se- yes. our first segment here. Yeah, yes. But it does fly by. Um, but I have two. Uh, let me check to see. I don't have other. I have two crucial questions. That, uh, of course. Uh, the standard in apocalypse questions asked uh, generally every show. Um, what's your favorite type of rock? Oh, that's a hard one for me. Okay. Okay. I, I have a very specific answer for this. Yes. Um, because, well, my game, okay, the Crimson Diamond is very rock centric. You yes, can play uh, an, an amateur geologist and mineralogist. I, I was, when I was, when I was looking at some of your videos and I saw, oh, you're holding up a lot of rocks. I'm, ex- I'm, yeah. I'm anticipating, I'm getting excited for this question. <laughs> a rock, yeah, a true so rocket this, fan. This is a very significant and exciting question for me to answer. Yeah. Um, just even like last, uh, my last stream, I, I, I show, I've shown this rock off a, a number of times. I'm so proud of it. Yeah. E- every year in Ontario, there is something called the Bancroft Jamboree. And so that's like, so Bancroft is a, ta- a small town that's really known for being an area where you, there's a lot of like um, mines or there used to be and everything like that. There's a lot of like mineral variability and everything. And so the Crimson Diamond, the idea of my game is that you are going to a town, a, go, a ghost town that, that's been abandoned that used to be a mining town called Crimson, Ontario, because it was an old garnet mining town. And I, you know, having done my research and everything, I know that, you know, Canadian garnets are a thing. Like we do have quite a lot of garnets in Canada. And when I went to the Bancroft Jamboree, the first time I'd gone since I was a kid when my parents took me and my sister. Yeah. Um, many years later, I, I revisited just last summer. I was so excited to go. And they had all these wonderful vendors and they had, yeah, they had, they had one particular vendor um, who had these amazing garnets from River Valley, Ontario. And this thing is the size of like the size and color of like a black plum, you know, those really, and yes. it's heavy. And it's like, it's a 12 sided garnet crystal that is the most, inc- one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And I can't believe I get to own it, but having it, having it be something that 
is very much tied into thematically what my game is, like geologically and mineralogically what my game is. And just having like a cool like crystal red, like a red crystal stone with these wonderful um, diamond shaped growth patterns on it. I'm comp I'm always blown away by it. And I'm blown away when I went to the, to the show. I'm always blown away by like the infinite variability of minerals and rocks you can find all around the world. And everywhere in the world, there is something beautiful. Yeah, And, and yeah, that's I, something I, I really love. I, I'm fascinated in, in only, I'm just looking at this, uh, this is the aforementioned Jambri online is like it reminds me of like oh yes there are also like uh, an infinite number of uh, specialty fairs and events that have been running forever that we were just yes. like, we, we are just completely unaware about just like a million subcultures that just yes. exist it's, it's yeah it's it's been around for more than <clears throat> more than 50 years <clears throat> And yeah, it's got it's got everything under the sun. I, I bought a, a bunch of different stuff there, and I wish I wish to go again sometime soon for sure. Oh, perfect. Uh, and I have a second follow up question, uh, an optional. And this is an mm -hmm. optionally answered question, which is: Do you have a favorite Toho character? Oh, see, I, I listened to some some of your episodes. <laughs> okay. And I I I forgot to to do the research on this one. Oh no, Toho. it's it's not requ it's not required. <laughs> Okay, so let, I'm going to take a quick look. I'm going to Google image things. Okay. <laughs> okay, what do we have here? Okay. Uh, Toho 1 to 5 characters. Okay, um, let's take a look at this This one This one image. Okay, if I had to pick one out of this. See, I, I've never, I've never, I'm assuming this is a game that I've never played. Yeah, it's a, it's a long running, uh, long running. Uh, mm -hmm. When did the first, the first one came out on the PC 98. So it's been around for a very um, long time. Um, okay. But yes. Who would I, yeah. Oh, 97. Yeah, I love the art. Um, yeah. If I was going to pick one of these characters... Oh, it's so hard. Um, I guess I'm going to go with... Let's go with... My eye is drawn to Rikako Asakura. She has nice, sensible boots, the kind I like. <laughs> and she... Yeah, I, you know what? It's funny because yeah, now that I have, I I I, pick, I blew, blew up the the image. She's got like a nice little yellow yellow bow scarfy thing that yeah. actually my character has in in my game, which I didn't even notice on the when I looked at this from a long shot. But uh, and I used to wear glasses too, so like, and she's got the purple hair that I've I've dyed my hair purple like year, many moons ago. Um, so yeah, I would say I would say if I was gonna cosplay as anyone, I would cosplay as her. I also really like her dress. So Rikako Asakura is my favorite Toho character Perfect. as of now. Thank you, thank you. That is a, it's a it's a first as well. Uh, oh wow! Okay, so what is that? I don't know. I don't know anything about her. So what does what 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 does she like? I, I'm not sure either. <laughs> I'm, not, <laughs> I'm neither. I, I'm not. I'm not a, a premier Toho expert, but okay. Someone sent it in for a long time, and it's always a, it's a curious question to ask because it's like a, you know, kind of kind of like you know DOS era art, uh, adventure games. It's a whole like massive like pocket of game development that sometimes people just do or do not know about. Um, if, like, yeah, that's a good reason to like learn Japanese would be to delve into like a lot of the PC 98 type of adventure games. Yes. Um, I also stand with my arms crossed like that a lot. And I'm actually really curious now if anyone's listening, who is like, who, if you are the Toho expert, I feel like I've just taken like a personality test or yes. like an inkblot test where you pick something out of a chart and whichever, whichever one comes out to you is the one that kind of tells you deep insight into your personality. So please let me know if, what, what it means if I pick Rikako Asakura out of all these other characters. Yes. One of the few people, according to the <laughs> wiki, value science more than magic. But she can use both. Oh, okay. I, I think I'm with her. Yes. I, no, okay. No. I'm gonna do more research. I'm gonna learn all about myself. Okay. Gonna use Toho as <laughs> as, uh, uh, as another form of astrology. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but Julia, thank you for joining me here today. Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, um, so much. Uh, we're gonna go out and break for like two minutes and forty eight seconds, uh, more or less, and then we'll be back. Uh, so bye for now. Okay. Bye. Hello, welcome back to Indie Apocalypse Radio. That was Chumps with uh, Jet Lag Dragon. I don't think that if I I'm gonna look this up eventually during this segment, perhaps. But that, I'm pretty sure that album is not from 2020, unless it was unreleased stuff before 2020. They're like a 80s no wave band, I believe. But anyway, we are here with our next guest, 
who you may know from issue 49 of Indie Apocalypse with Making the Leap, is Kinardo. Kinardo, how are you doing today? I am great. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you here. Now, we, 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 we mentioned this question uh, briefly. This question was rather alluded to briefly um, during the unrecorded chat pre pre chat section but uh my unofficial marketing question that i need to ask you um, is how did you hear about indie apocalypse i heard about indie apocalypse uh surprisingly via twitter um <laughs> kind of felt like a, a rare instance where i actually saw something beneficial yes on that app <laughs> yeah, where yeah, yeah uh, you had um yeah, you had sent out a post kind of uh, seeking submissions uh, for the upcoming uh, edition. And I guess someone that I followed liked that post, so it showed up in my feed, and that was really, like, my introduction to it. Um, so I just kind of showed up in my feed, read kind of the post, and I'm like, you know, I have a little game that I put out a couple months ago that might be a good fit for this. And at that point, it was really just... I would. I mean, it was. It's my first game I've ever made right. on PC. Uh, just little. This little thing. Um, and at that point, I was just excited. You know, I actually have something to submit for something which I had never done before. Um, so I submitted and just kind of figured that would be it. I didn't really expect anything to come of it, but here we are today. So yes, it's yeah. been so yeah. exciting. Here, here you are today. Some uh, sixty to seventy dollars richer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, uh, but that is also it's yeah no that is because uh, part of part of what it f is for is f a lot you know for games like uh, making the leap of like small short experiences that like I mean they have a home on itch but that that that's like a very vague home you know of mm -hmm. like it's a self publishing platform so technically everything has a home on itch. But mm -hmm. uh, beyond just posting it, like sometimes those sorts of games, it's harder to like, you know, where do you, where do you fit them in, you know? Right. How, yeah. How do... And I mean, well, I mean, I mean, for me, like it was like, I knew, I knew itch was somewhere I could put something like this. Yeah. Um, Because so, I mean, the, the backstory of making the leap as well is like, this is my first PC game. Yes. Um, but it's not actually the first time I've made that game. Um, I actually made it originally uh, in Dreams on PlayStation 4. Um, for those people that are unaware, Dreams is a PlayStation game by Media Molecule, who made like Little Big Planet, um, which was very much about you know it's 2D platformer, but it's very much you know uh, about yeah. creating your own goals and creating your own experiences and then sharing it with you know that game's community. Yeah. Um, and Dream yeah, Dreams kind of, you know, takes that philosophy and expands it out. And, you know, instead of just a little big planet levels, now you can, like, it's it's basically a game engine housed on the PlayStation 4. Yeah, it, it's um, like, because within little big planet, you could do, you could set up like a little scripting and all sorts of, like, it wasn't just like a level builder. It was. Like, right, yeah. It was, it was very fully it, featured. And then, like, Dreams feels like mm -hmm. the furthest extrapolation of, like, oh, what if we didn't have. What if we didn't uh, like put, have like the little big planet as the basis that, that you're building your thing out of? Yeah. And yeah. Just... So and for I yeah I got into dreams in 2020. It was kind of like my my pandemic. Um, right. <laughs> my pandemic game just kind of like something for me to try because like I've always loved games and I've always kind of loved the idea of trying to make one myself, but it just always felt beyond my reach right and i mean i was other, doing other things with my life at the time like i think um you know artistically um my my original dream my original kind of passion in life was acting um i actually went to new york for acting school and spent some time out there and like it just really didn't pan out for me which was really difficult um, right but i still have that you know creative itch i'm just like there's still something out there i wanted to do but I just like you know like for a long time I didn't even know what it was like I had like a a creative writing phase as well um which again just like didn't really feed me the way it needed to and just yeah. like I mean just wasn't 
it just wasn't the fit I needed. And then just uh, finally, just kind of, I think it was late 2019. Um, there were two games that came out in 2019 that like really spoke to me and like push kind of pushed me over the edge into like just instead of just being a lover of games, being someone that's like, okay, I actually need to try and do this myself. Um, and those games were Outer Wilds and Death Stranding. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah I, just, yeah, I actually bought my PlayStation because Death Stranding was coming out. Um, so I played that game and it just, it really moved me in a way that like I hadn't ever expected a game could, or like just really any like art, like nothing had really moved me the way that game had before. Yeah. Um, and it just kind of pushed me over the edge. I'm just like, like, not necessarily trying to make a game on that level, obviously, which like I got it. Right. Gotta, you know, like, <laughs> that's, that's the, that. you, you avoided the pitfall of like, I want to make my first game. It's I'm going to make my own death stranding. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. And at that point, just like, you know, I had the PlayStation I knew I had known about dreams for a while. And I'm just like, you know, let me at least see like this, this thing that exists that supposedly makes, you know, game development easier for newcomers. Let me check this out and see if I can even make something in it before I try to build something, you know, more in a more traditional engine than PC. Or right, whatever. right. Because, um, it, so, so. because kind of like we were talking about with AGS earlier, like Dreams does a lot of the work for you. It saves you a lot of the trouble. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, that was basically how I spent 2020 um, was building my first game in Dreams, um, which was not Making the Leap. Actually, Making the Leap was the second game I made. Um, but the, the first game I uh, made was kind of a, like an action brawler, kind of hotline Miami esque where it's yeah. like, you know, top down. Um, and it was, you know, super duper fun to make. I'm really, um, <laughs> mostly happy with how it turned out. Um, but you know, I, you know, that first game is never, I mean, no game is ever really perfect, but that, like that first game, like you work on it so long and it comes out and like from my experience at least like i play tested it after releasing it and like immediately found like a few bugs that i just had not found yeah in play testing which like again like thankfully dreams also makes it super duper easy to like update your games when those things happen so like but just yeah like working on something as long as i did because it really was like the entirety of my 2020 um working on this game um you know putting it out there and you know people liking it um but it just the, the way I put it is the game was just good enough for me to really hate problems it had. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, that's the, 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 the satisfaction of making art is learning to hate your art <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in a, in a yeah. weird way. Yeah. So, so that came out and that was really cool. And then, um, I think it was shortly after I released Neon Vendetta, um, uh, Media Molecule also kind of hosts game jams. Uh, yeah. for the dreams community and they did one um i think either march or april um i think it's like autism awareness month and they did um they did a, a jam uh that they were working with the this i think they're a non-profit in the uk uh that's called autistica where they're doing you know an uh, autism awareness jam um with a theme of anxiety breakthroughs um, and just kind of given where I was at that time, having just released my game um, and, you know, like that process had been kind of anxiety ridden as well. Um, plus, you know, I do have family that are on the spectrum. So, you know, it meant a lot to me yeah. to make something um, for this jam. Um, so that's really where the original uh, Making the Leap came from, is just kind of kind of uh, condensing, you know, my experience with like, you know, trying something like this for the first time and just like the difficulties of, you know, just iteration really, um, especially as a newcomer um, and like all at the same time, you know, seeing people that are just making these incredible things, like not just in dreams, but in general, but like particularly in dreams for me, it was just like, you know, how are people doing this? You know, right. Just Cause like dreams does make a lot of things super duper easy. But like the the main thing I learned working on games and dreams was just like game development. It's hard. Like yes. Even when it's <laughs> right. even when it's made easier for you, it is still really really hard. 
Um, so, I mean, if nothing else, like it's given me, a, you know, much greater appreciation for the art form and, you know, it's something I'm eager to continue doing, but, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been an adventure. And then, you know, to, to follow up, it's like, I released making the leap in dreams and, uh, it, it does really, it, like, it strikes a chord with the community and yeah. does really, really well played like, by tons of people. Um, and then at the end of the year, um, within the Dreams community, Media Molecule also hosts what they call the Impy Awards, which is kind of like a community, you know, BAFTAs, um, where they, you know, recognize like, you know, best games, you know, best, you know, artwork, because, you know, Dreams is not just about games. Like you can make music, you can make, you know, artwork and just, yeah, you know, they, kind I... of. Just, just looking at their site, they've got like a, also like a very good way of like displaying their whole ecosystem. Like mm -hmm. even, even just like at a at a visual, um, like the difference between like a, a, a game release or like a, a musical release, and you can just like play mm -hmm. music in browser. It looks like. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So uh, so making making a leap in dreams that year uh, ended up getting nominated for excellence in narrative. Um which was just incredible for me that, uh, and I'm just super duper, you know, thankful that thankful that I was able to make it and thankful that it struck a chord with so many people. Um, and you know, that was a huge encouragement for me to finally, you know, kind and I just, it, it was too thematically perfect for me to use as kind of my first attempt at making something on PC. Right. Um, and it, it made that whole process easier for me as well, because like, I had already designed the game. Like I didn't have to like learn a new, you know, learn a new engine and learn new processes for, you know, creating sprites and whatnot. Um, and come up with an idea for a game at the same time. Like I could just kind of copy what I had already did. Yeah. So how did you, so, end, like, what did you end up making it in uh, after, like when you made the transition over to PC? Um. So making believe on PC, it was built in unity. Okay. Yeah. And, and like, what was your, I guess like the, um, like, like, like what was your, your transition, like your, your, your tool set transition? Like, can you, cause you can't pull things from dreams. Like you can't pull like sprites no. and stuff from dreams. Right? right. Yeah. So, um, my workflow with, with making leave is, um, and cause it was part of, you know, remaking it is just like, I really want it to be as truthful to the original game as possible. Yeah. Um, so, uh, basically pretty much everything, uh, in the game, uh, was basically rotoscoped in Microsoft paint. Okay. Like even, like even all the, the text bubbles, like the text animation, like, yeah. I know there's like, I, and it's just like, I know there's other ways to like animate text, particularly in, in unity and stuff, but at the time, like the easiest way for me to kind of like wrap my head around how to make it work, like particularly for me, was just like literally animate it frame by frame. Now, when you say rotoscope, like were you rotoscoping like footage of uh, like the original making the leap? Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I was yeah. able. So like I have, I think I had put because um, I I have a YouTube channel. Yeah, just, yeah. Like, you know, just sharing. Um, mainly just sharing these games with like my friends that don't have dreams at the right. time. Um, just, you know, put, put up a full gameplay of, uh, of making the leap for my friends to see. Um, so I just, I would just pull that up, um, on my computer and yeah, just kind of frame by frame, just kind of. Rotoscoping um, your own game. <laughs> rotoscope my own game. Yeah. Huh. Oh, that, that is like, and then, and, you know, that is also like a very, uh, you know, classical approach, like rotoscoping itself is also, you know, telling with the first guy, mm -hmm. a really classical technique in game development. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. like, I mean, like, and I enjoyed it too. Like, yeah. I know there's, you know, myriad different ways I could have done the same work and, you know, achieved the same effect. Um, but just something about, you know, that process actually you know, felt really good and enjoyable to do. So I'm just like, well, this is working. Um, I'm yeah. not going to get too hung on, you know, the best possible way. Right. That, yes. You know, <laughs> you, you, know what, gonna you know, what's better than the best possible way. It's the way that gets it done. <laughs> you know, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it, it's always better to be done than to be perfect. Uh, 
Yes, it very is. much. And it's just like, I mean, I'm, you know, sometimes painfully aware too, just like, I, I kind of like leverage my own experience in a way as like right. a creative limitation. It's just like, you know, I could you know, work really hard and, you know, maybe it would come out, you know, slightly better, but just ultimately like, you know, I, I ran a test and just, it, it worked and I'm like, okay, I'm not going to, you know, there's so many other elements of the design that like require more brain power than yes. this does right now. Like I'm going to focus on that and let this be as good as it is because it, you know, it does what it needs to. Yeah. That's, that's, uh, it's the thing. It's like, <laughs> why, why, uh, spend so much time making, uh, the version, like, like what would you, if you like, what would you gain necessarily by doing it all? Like, okay, I'm going to do it all from scratch. I'm going to learn, you know, you know, someone might tell you, Oh, make learning blender or learning some mm -hmm. kind of tool like that is like the better version of uh, making the game. But yeah. Yeah. And like the, uh, the version made in dreams, um, was also, um, like it's a 2d platformer yeah. gameplay wise, but it was built in 3d just because I'm, dreams is kind of built as a 3d game engine. Like you can do exclusively 2d, but it is more difficult than it would right, be. Right. Right. It's a, it's a, it, um, it, just, it is know, like, yeah. I understand, um, just, you know, looking for simplicity where I can find it in this process. Um, so doing it in 2d this way, like actually in a way like better, better represents what I was trying to do with the game to begin with. Right. Like I just, just used 3d initially just because like it was easier, but in, in this particular instance, bring it PC, like 2d was actually easier. Um, and I think better, better fits the style of game that it is. Yeah. Cause you know, initially you're, uh, like purposefully like have to exclude elements that are there. You're like, no, I need you to move in two dimensions and need it to be displayed in two dimensions. Uh, you know, I need, and you know, like, like, uh, what, what would be just a couple of white lines? Like, well, what do the, what do the surfaces look like in, in dreams? Are they at least like, if you have a top down view, are they like extended platforms? Yeah. Yeah. They actually, yeah, they're exactly that. Um, cause yeah, the, the way kind of your, your initial like dreams scene that you would start building in, like it yeah. always has just kind of a, a flat pl platform for you to start placing things on and start building off of. Um, and for making the leap, like I literally just kind of turned that on its side and just had that be like the platform that the, the character uh, walks around on. Right. Right. So you need to, yeah, it, it is like an interesting, like you're almost, is like <laughs> working within the, not the limitations, but like the inverse of that, like working well, I'm trying to think of how to, how to describe how to phrase this, but you know, you're working with within the you're working to limit uh, the tool set you're working with in a weird way. Yeah, yeah, almost, yeah. You're like, yeah, it's you're almost, like, no, yeah. No. In, in, some, in some ways, the it's almost more than I needed for right, that particular like, problem. You're like, this is too strong for me. Actually, I want uh, <laughs> right, right. You're like, yeah. You know, you you've got like a, a twelve string guitar. You're like, no, no, I just need the one. I just need the one, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I have, yeah, to, have, yeah. have to find a way to play this without you hitting the other eleven strings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that that initial scene, like, it also you know comes, um, you know, pre-built with like you know global lighting and just like that's already all set up for you. And just like I didn't, like, I turned that all off. Like I didn't right. need that for this game. I knew I wanted to just be, you know, super minimalist, just black and white. Um, minimal, like, you know, sound design. And you just has really wanted to make a game just as simple as I could. Um, simple, but, you know, powerful. Because yes. I think it, thematically, obviously, like it's something that a lot of people feel or it can relate to, um, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. It's been... yeah like it, it's the. Uh... You know, I talk about it, uh, this on the show. It's the tricky thing about art is that uh, uh, the budget does not really have anything to do with how much another human will connect with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, like, the length and all of that is all uh, uh, sort of unrelated to the work. Right. 
Um, and I'm curious now, did you have any experience with like other sort of, I mean, you mentioned little big planet, but, do, and well, not that you had used it, but had you used, had you messed around with little big planet or any other kind of like within game, like game making or level building tools at all before dreams? Not really. No. Yeah. Like I said, like I hadn't, I was, I didn't have a PlayStation until, um, just before dreams came in. Oh, okay. Um, nice. So, I mean, I, I was aware of Little Big Planet, and, like, right. I remember, I do remember, like, when it was first announced, like, it really kind of getting my attention. Because, like, like I said, like, it's been a long time that I've wanted to make a game, but just, like, again, didn't have the resources or, like, the the real drive to do it. Um, but, you know, seeing that, you know, kind of um, just, you know, making game design more accessible like that, um, just you know definitely got my attention so like they've been they've been on my radar for a really long time yeah but it wasn't until that i kind of you know finally took the plunge so to speak yeah those those sorts of tools are like super useful like i I said in the previous segment that i started in ags but really i started in like starcraft (laughs) yeah like like editing maps in starcraft Mm -hmm. was where i really yeah no i i think there was a it wasn't I can't remember which one of the like time splitters games. Yeah. Had a, had a level editor that I, I messed around. I mean, just like, you know, um, what was it like Halo three and the forge? Um, I messed around in quite a bit as well. So, you know, stuff like that, um, I, I have messed with, but like nothing, nothing quite on this level. Now here's a question for, now, uh, this, I don't think you, not necessarily asking you to have an answer to this because it's a very bizarre question. <laughs> I don't think you would have an answer to this, but it made me think of it. Um, so, so Time Splitters 2. In, in my memory, yeah. I, there, was a, there was a custom map um, based on the Mask of the Red Death. And I'm like, did I make that or did I play someone else's version of that? I don't remember. And I'm just putting that thought out into the ether so it gets out of my own brain. Yeah, that I think so. The the one I'm talking about isn't Time Splitters too. I think it was yeah. maybe the one after that. Um, that seems sick though. Yes, I I I've, I don't know if that was me messing around with color lighting or me seeing that somebody else did it. But Google searches never show any like, or even DuckDuckGo searches, which I use <laughs> typically, um, uh, give me no results for that. So I'm I'm thinking is was that something I made as a pretentious teen? I don't remember. <laughs> Um, that's that cool though. but there is like yeah that that like pretentious teens could just like make uh, like you consider like oh I could just make a time splitters map and maybe it's not mm-hmm. good but mm-hmm. you can you can you know you can make something very quickly yeah and it, and it gives yeah. you these like all these tool sets to to just like mess around and it's it's nice to have it's the, the equivalent of like you know, ha- like having a piano that you can just like jam on, <laughs> like not make music yeah. technically, I guess. But well, just, I mean, like if you don't want to go that far, just like, you know, if you love a game, like this was how it was for, for Halo with me. Right. Like if you like the, the ability to like have a game you love that you can then create your own, you know, combat encounters or just a kind of like a, create your own space in that game. Yeah. Like, super duper special. Right, even if it's you know not used by, uh, I've I've talked about this. My brother and I at some point stopped playing Halo Two and started. We turned it into a racing game. Uh, yeah. By yeah. by design, I mean I don't think there was any tool sets we could use, but by basically just des- like designing our own tracks, um, mm-hmm. and like with tool set with like you know map editors, that's something you could do. You just like through a mixture of like tools and kind of like. Uh, socially enforced house rules. You can make your own games out of like completely different games. Yeah. Or I'm just like, I mean, I think it was Halo Two, um, where the community like basically created the uh, the infection game type um, that like is now part of like the core like experience of like Halo games. That like the the devs actually include an infection mode where like you know uh, it's basically you know zombie mode. Where like there's one team of zombies that slowly, you know, as they kill the other team, the 
those members of the other team become zombies. Like that was done just via um, those people, like literally switching teams. Right. Uh, Halo Two while they while they played. Like it wasn't a supported official game type, but it grew so popular within the community that they ended up actually adding it to the the later games in the series. Yeah, that's like it's it's the fascinating thing about games and like how we like inherently have to interact with them. You know. <laughs> Yeah, it, it creates like these interesting dynamics we have with them. It's you know talking about you know that's why like I you know aforementioned text parses are interesting because it's like how we interact with games and how we and how how we play with them and like developers kind of trying trying to understand or at least giving enough like leeway in, in spaces where people can sort of interact with them how they choose, but also in some mm-hmm. cases like not giving that leeway and they were being like, you know, very linear experiences. And that's like, you know, games are such a broad uh, medium of like what they can be. Uh, They really are. It's something I think about a lot. I think why we need more genres and like language to describe like, like (laughs) very weird that making the leap and Halo 2 are the same thing, you know? (laughs) same medium yeah same they're both video games <laughs> just straightforward mm-hmm. they're both video games we don't have yeah. di- different words for them yeah yeah that is wild to think about and just and just like that's what's so awesome about right right games. like you know like i said like uh they can provide experiences that kind of no other medium really can and then like in a diverse amount of ways as well. Um, yeah, I'm just happy to finally kind of be taking my first steps into this world because it's meant a lot to me my entire life. Um, yeah. So like getting getting to be part of the, the creation space of it uh, has been awesome. And just the fact, you know, that alone has been super duper rewarding, but I mean, to be included in this collection and to be on talking to you today is is a real privilege well hey you know what uh, glad to have you here this 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 thing doesn't work without the, the people who make games you know uh uh it's like if you did it is like uh what's the word i'm looking for second place to the games that are within it um it is uh, a, a true pleasure to have to have you here like this is the the joy of the show is that i think things should be big wide and open i'm like what little way can i do to help uh the medium feel like it's big wide and open and that you don't have to have four million dollars to make a game yeah (laughs) because i don't have four million (laughs) dollars right but uh yeah it's just and because you know prior to seeing your post randomly show up right like i didn't like i did not think anything like this existed yes in the and that's space and it's funny and you saw that probably about four years into its existence give or take yeah right uh, so yeah that, that's the thing it's so it's such a wide a wide medium and i think part of why i try to get more into offline spaces is because online spaces you know they it, it's very funneling towards the biggest things often mm-hmm. uh, but anyway, we've got, before we get into the deeper like, questions, uh, Kinata, we're approaching the end of our time, so I have two questions. You had time to prepare for these questions. Yes. Up front, what's your favorite type of rock? Favorite type of rock? I have a soft spot for, like, 90s alternative. Okay. Well, we'll take it in the opposite direction from Julia, who took it very geological. I'll take it more musical and that- say... 90s alternative is what I grew up with, and it's just whenever it comes on, it's it makes me happy. That that is part of that's part of the litmus test of asking people what their favorite rock is, which 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 <laughs> side do they skew towards? Yeah. Um, I I weirdly growing up in the 90s, I came to it later because you know I was a, okay. Um, or I guess when I say alternative, I came to what I what I think of as canonical alternative stuff later in life, you know. Uh, sure. Your, I mean, I played I played Slint in part of the pre-show. You know. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Is that alternative? Is that math rock? Is that 
who knows? That's but that's uh, also the fun thing about music is there's eighty million genres for every band or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and follow up question: uh, Do you have a favorite Toho character? So I did my research about on this before the show as well. Okay. But I feel like I researched the wrong Toho. Oh, did you research my... Toho Studios? Godzilla. Yes. Yes, that's the other Which... thing of me. There, there is a, probably a way to pronounce Toho, but I don't know how to do it with like uh, an English first accent, you know? Oh, okay. <laughs> but, it's probably, uh, yes. There's probably a better way to say that it emphasizes that there's two U's in there, but I'm bad oh, at it. okay. Got you. So in would you say case, Godzilla? Yeah. Are, you, are you a Mothra fan? So I think, like, I, there was uh, Ghidorah and yes. Rodan were cool as well. But Godzilla's the king. You king, can't beat Godzilla. King of, king of all monsters, you might say. Yes. But and uh, like, did did you, did you get a chance to see Godzilla minus one? I have not. I've, I I think the last I have a weird relationship with Godzilla that I think I've seen. Uh, I saw it not like ninety six or was ninety six ninety eight whatever the American was one when I was younger. The, the Roland Emmerich yes. one with Roderick. Yes. Um, later. I saw that. One. Later in life, I saw I we watched a friend and I watched the original plus the American version of the original back to back. Okay, which is a I have fun. Not done that. It's a fun experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the American version has an American in the corner of a lot of the scenes, and they've recut it. <laughs> it's very weird. Yeah. Um, but Godzilla Minus One was probably my favorite film last year. I'm trying to think. I don't know if I Honestly. watched. A 2023 film. Um, really? Yes. Last year was pretty good. Yeah, the, the, I, the, here the, I have a pile of movies that uh, that I need to watch. Pretty good. Do I have? Actually, I might have a movie from. Is this from 2020? No, it's 2022. I was gonna say I have a pile of movies to watch, but uh, like it's Pinocchio from 2023. But no, it's from 2022. But I do have that. Is that the Guillermo del Toro I one? Do, yes, I do have the del Toro Pinocchio on hand. To That's watch. good too. I'm a big uh, del Toro fan. Uh, yes. I endlessly am a huge. Anyway, when, before we start talking about the devil's backbone, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we're going to go on break. Thank you for joining me here, Canardo. Um, yeah, thank you. We are going to be, I'll be back in about uh, two minutes and 47 seconds. Uh, goodbye for now. Hello and welcome back to Indie Apocalypse Radio. That was uh, Cloud Nothing. So let's stay useless. Almost, uh, uh, I was gonna say almost not Yellow Turner, but that's not there from like 2012. Uh, <laughs> nowhere near it. We're back. Hello, uh, Julie Canado are both back here. We got the whole <laughs> gang hanging out um, on the show. I, you can tell the warm weather is approaching because I'm like dipping back into my old favorites, uh, musical <laughs> music wise. When I when you know when you bust out the whole I Nako demo on the on the intro, it's like, ah, warm weather. I've put away my larger coat, and now I only have my sweatshirt for going out. But anyway, we're back. Uh, how y'all doing? Good. <laughs> ah. I am closing these Toho <laughs> tabs, fully Toho. <laughs> these rock jamborees, these. Uh, dreams tabs are all closed all these tabs are out of the way oh no i was like huh i had in my mind an idea i was like i need to have segments for this show and then i forgot to make them but it seems like a it's... sorry no that's usually how things go yeah i was like well because 90 percent of the time the show has been like a uh let's just hang out and talk about games or not games or talk about food and because i have a a kind of fascination with uh what's the word i'm looking for like the standard like kind of like uh, i don't know working class or like the common food when i go to places um stuff that i can't get like around where i am which is often not like oh look at this really good thai restaurant we have up here and it's like well i have one of those near me but i don't what i don't have near me is poutineries <laughs> Uh, so that's like my my 
is, is tricking people to tell me about what the kind of stuff that they like so I can get obsessed with like Tesco meal deals or whatever. But, uh, but that all said, uh, uh, video games, huh? What wild things those are. Uh, <laughs> There's something that you, you, you and Kineta were talking about, yeah. about like the methods of interactions of, in games. Yes. And if we should limit, like, you know, in terms of limiting versus not limiting. And, you know, of course, you know, speaking from, from where I'm sitting as a, doing a text parser, which is, is I admit, is quite limiting right. <laughs> in, a, in a way. Um, and also the fact that, yeah, I mean, w when you do this, not even just it's it's a tough interface to use, but it's also like, well, I it's not like I would necessarily... I can't really port this to a console, for instance. Like, yeah, you know, right. I'm also, you also self-limit yourself in that, you know, it's it's not like a tippy-tappy game where you can just touch an iPad here and then touch it there and then that's the game being played. Um, I think when you're when you're independent and you can kind of do your own thing and you have an opportunity to find, like, your little niches that you can then fit into, it's more possible to explore not being the most convenient method of interaction. Yes. And <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I think about this often when people, when I go to, like, events and people a surprising number of people seem utterly bewildered by how to use a controller <laughs> and but even then it's like uh why why i on my own on my own keyboard it must be a gamer keyboard um because w a s and d are in red uh, but also you don't need to use those actually the, like mm -hmm. uh, we have we have the shared language but i think so many people exist without that outside of that shared language so you can kind of use whatever you want. And it's, it's, it's seen a... people like when I show my, my at events, I've seen people like my, my game to text person adventure game. I've seen people trying to move the character around with WASD and that's definitely not going to work. Right. Right. <laughs> no. And there, there is, there is so much of like, right. Like, and, and learning text parsers are fascinating things in and of themselves because they're sort of like, you're learning like not a second language, but like a, a sub language, if that makes yes, sense. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You're learning a dialect mm -hmm. of like how to understand how, how the game works. And a lot of, and a lot of games do operate on this sort of, you're learning these sort of different languages that you require to interact with the games. Can you, can you uh, kind of describe what you mean by a text parser real quick? Cause I'm actually not familiar with the term. Oh yeah, uh, sure. So um, what it is is yeah, it's uh, you use your keyboard and you type commands in. Like uh, you would talk to a character, you would put talk to Jack, or you could ask Jack about fish, or you would type open door or look at room, and then the computer would then like give you a description of what the room is like wow. or talk. Yeah, you know, so it's a very kind of open ended way of interacting with a game, especially in in conversation. Like there's no dialogue trees in my game. It's just like you ask. Sure. You ask, you know, you talk to a character and he'll tell, give you some like nouns that you could then ask about, you could, you know, and then you, the, the sure. conversation kind of flows more naturally from that, um, which is kind of nice because I'm, I'm making a mystery game and yeah. it's nice to have this idea that you can ask things that you could then learn about and, and it's not on display as like kind of like a, like a laundry list of, of dialogue options. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that does sound like uh, it would be challenging. Yes, yeah, because there's also, you know, it's a computer, so if you misspell something, um, yes, it, or, or like you, you're not using the right words, like you, like you, like you learn, like okay, I want, I want look, I want take, I want push, pull, like these kind of what eventually Lucas would adapt into, like their little button grid or whatever, mm -hmm. was the sort of like default language and like learning what these default verbs are that most people um, are familiar with, right. Yeah, that's what I thought it was initially, but I figured I'd clarify. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's a, it's like a, a uh, it's a neat approach, especially like yes, I had somehow that it, it slipped by me the idea of, oh, without a dialogue tree, um, mm -hmm. you need to like be more active in like the mystery solving, um, mm -hmm. because you need to be able to like. You, you, the person, the human being playing the games, <laughs> needs to be able to conjure the words that right. you're looking for. You need, you need to know what are the right questions to ask. Yeah, 
Yes, and, and also what you can interact with. You could, so you're not just clicking around on a screen. If you type look, you see, okay, there's a cupboard, there's a sink, and you can, these things, so you can then look at sink or turn on sink. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very engaged way of playing, and it's, it's, you don't really see it much these days. And I, I have a tutorial room in my game to teach, like you mentioned, like there's a kind of almost like a, like a dialect or a grammar that yeah. you have to learn for adventure games. So I do have a tutorial room in my game that kind of walks you through like the most basic commands that you might want to use and then you know you can go from there but it's also like very helpful and now i think about it, it's like you you can't you don't have to worry about like pixel hunting in a text parser because <laughs> you're not clicking on anything um so it's like if there if there is like a tiny little latch somewhere in the room it'll say oh you know you see a small latch in the corner of the room yes exactly exactly so yeah. it's like and you know it's almost it's it's another perfect example of uh these things are not like games are not like, you know, the the move away from text parser to the context based and uh, kind of like cursor based. It's not like a strict upgrade over the text mm -hmm. parser style. Exactly. I think something does get lost along the way, especially like nowadays, um, more modern games or specifically adventure games will have like a one button interaction interface where right. you just are clicking things. And depending on if you're clicking on a person, you're going to talk to the person. If it's an object, you'll look at the object. Um, and it's like, yeah, it's definitely good for porting to like consoles or, or iPads and things like that. But I do think, yeah, there's a level of nuanced interaction that does get lost. Yeah. There's like, you know, you would want to be able to, like, there's something to, even if it doesn't do anything to be able to look, you know, attempt to interact with and, you know, you know, run the verbs across every single object, which, you know, also, uh, quadruples your writing load. <laughs> To some extent. Yeah, it's a lot of writing. <laughs> <laughs> but but there is like a there's a charm to it, a charm to like uh, you know I can't I'm I'm not touching it because you know you can throw in some stock kind of responses for when you whenever you want to talk to something that obviously is not going to talk back to you, but you can you know inject a lot of like small flavor into that sort of stuff. Uh, you know, that, that that's the fun of it. That's the magic of it. Right. Right, a, a lot of flavor is lost when you are when you have only the linear path of this object interact with exactly how you expect it to, mm. and that is like it, it is like almost like a divergence between like it skews more towards um, uh, like story game if that makes sense rather than like it skews further from puzzle game to some in some degree. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think of it more of like an like an actual more like a book right. kind of based game, not a movie or a cinematic type of game. Yeah. Yeah, there's like, oh, we we could sit here uh, <laughs> uh, discussing logistics <laughs> of adventure games forever, um, and now I am like thinking about getting into just an adventure game. I, I fall down these weird like holes, you know, of mm -hmm. things that I get fascinated with, and I am often very fascinated just by like adventure games in general uh, like uh, of of the of the games i watch people play those are often the only ones i will watch people play even if i don't know the person i will be like i just want to see somebody play an adventure game because uh, it's a story right yeah. and there's always going to be this this desire to experience stories whether you're doing it directly or indirectly yeah um, and sometimes the person like um playing it like it helps create like is your is your buffer between some of the mechanics you may not like, <laughs> be in the mood sure. to deal with uh, mm -hmm. and like the kind of like uh, the messiness of you know there's a beautiful messiness to adventure games a, a lot of the time especially when they uh -oh. just like become extremely self-indulgent <laughs> uh, for me um the kinds of games I play anyway, like I, I'm, I've never been like a really good hand-eye coordination, dexterous, like re reaction time type of person. Right. I was never really interested like strategy games either. So I, I always felt like the adventure game genre is a really good one for people who might not have even played games really before. Yeah. So that's why you get like, you know, visual novel or adventure game type of games where you don't, you're not being challenged, like physically challenged by the game. It's just a, a story you can interact with and experience. And I think that a lot of people could find an appeal to that that maybe they feel like oh games aren't for them because they you know oh i can't shoot someone you know in the head yes. from 300 yards or something yeah but i think something well sorry i think something special about like the adventure genre as well um in, in regards to kind of um accessibility by people yeah uh, 
the the, sa- the failure states are much more like friendly. Mm-hmm. Like you know, if you know you're attempting to you know solve a puzzle in an adventure game, like you you, you might get stuck, but it's not like you're going to you know, die repeatedly, like you might, you know, another genre of game. Um, So I think that, you know, definitely another thing that, you know, makes it because I think a lot of people that don't play games um, don't. Yeah, I think this goes for a lot of people just don't like being confronted with failure. Yes. Um, So overcoming that that failure state gap um, can be tricky for a lot of people. And I think that, you know, in terms of, you know, genre i feel like adventure games probably do that maybe the best because a lot of times like you know it's just nope that's not the solution so you have to try something else and they they also have Mm -hmm. and i would and if you and if you do get stuck i shout this out here because i don't know where this site comes from why who made it but i got 98 it's so old (laughs) uh uh uh, the, the universal hint system is like a beautiful second arm of like adventure games because you know, yeah, plenty of times they can get dense and like having someone be like, have you looked at this? Like uh, for people unfamiliar with the universal hint system, it's like a very straightforward website that like you can click on, like I'm on right here now, you know, broken sword five and it, and it breaks it down like, uh, by like you know your current challenges your current thing and I'll like and I'll ask you questions like oh, what should I do next and like it, it says oh, try this and you can ask for another hint and I'll ask you and I'll provide you with like a secondary hint and you know, like get kind of get you closer without just like giving you a solution yeah it's a very cool God. website yes it's, yeah it's, it sounds great and it's another thing about adventure games too, like, and, and also that it shares in common with small games or shorter games is that, yeah, you don't have to invest hundreds of hours yeah. into something. And also even to just to start enjoying it. Like I always see those kind of memes on Twitter or whatever, about how in some of these role-playing games, you need to play like 23 hours or something before you can start enjoying it. And <laughs> yeah. that's like a barrier that I'm just unwilling to surmount. Yes. Really? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, something like an adventure game would is something that yeah, if you have a you know if you get stuck, you can consult a walkthrough. You could probably get through the whole thing in you know, a couple hours at most, really. Um, and then you can go on with your life and f- experience something else. Yeah, a lot of them have like uh, you know can have sort of uh, cinematic or uh, like a, a story type of pacing where there's like a, usually a big hook early on, you know, or some kind of like hey, here's the story. Welcome to the story. Um, and there, it is a, a, a fascinating genre that is, you know, kind of its own little thing. And it does it does have a lot in common with like, yeah, smaller, or shorter games because they are the like they are these tailored experiences. It's just working in a very uh, they're they're working within this very specific framework of like, you know, story puzzle solving inventory stuff. Uh, but you know, w- within that, there's also just a wide, wide like, uh, how many subgenres are there within adventure games? You know, yeah, it, it's it's not even just that it's an accessible like genre, but it's also that it's accessible to make adventure yes. games mm-hmm. too. Um, I would say it's probably one of the easiest kinds of games to make it. And I, you know, this is coming, I've been making my game for ages and I'm, I'm going to say it's not easy to make a game overall, but if you're going to pick one that is easier to do, I would say that something like an adventure game would be that. Yeah. Especially, I mean, especially if you are working within like a framework like AGS. Yes, exactly. Which yeah. is like, Hey, we got most of the work. We, you mostly just need to provide us. Like we made the the quote unquote game for you. <laughs> You just need to like make the work within the game. Yeah, do the fun stuff. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, that, and that if you want, if you want fighting in it, it's it's a short, it's short hop, hop and skip over to RPG Maker. You know, right? There's there's a lot of like uh, a, a room to make all sorts of styles of games. Um, I'm just clicking around with different images. I want to close those. Stop looking at broken sword images. Um. And another thing about not even just people can play games more easily, people can make games more easily, but also you can share your game more easily. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. which I love too. And so, you know, speaking of, you know, um, Kinarda, you're talking about 
having tried other things in your life creatively. And this is something where you can directly um, connect with people with, with something you've created. Um, yeah. And not have yeah. to like be hired on something or some larger project where you need you know, resources that you'd need to work with a bunch of people. You can make your right. own thing. You can share it directly with people and get that feedback. And there's yeah. almost nothing better. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't even really, you know, connected those dots, but you're absolutely right. But that, that is kind of the big difference. Cause I mean, and it's something, this part is something that I did become aware of. It's just like acting is so dependent on others to like make happen, just like even on its like most base level yeah um and just i mean you know art is complex as a solo creator but as you add more people it just becomes more and more complex mm -hmm. um so you know at least from where i'm at right now um just kind of solo development um yeah has been attainable yeah and something like in a way that things happen yeah. And something like dreams, you know, you can just like just on your profile, you can see like, oh, how interconnected as a community, something like dreams is, you know, mm -hmm. and how it is like, you know, dreams, especially is a very specific kind of edge case where like people build on their own work and you can like backtrace like what like where like if you use the skeleton, you can backtrace where that skeleton came from and who made that. Yeah. It, it's sort of like. Yeah designed to be this interconnected web of artists yeah which is its own like like you know it encourages people to not just make things in the ether and throw them out to an ether and just right. kind of uh, uh live in a uh, an endless art void yeah yeah so like those those first two projects that i made uh eon vendetta and making the leap like those i did like largely like create everything myself yeah um just because i you know wanted that challenge and just like especially starting out i was like let me see how much i can really do just on my own right um but then there like you know got a lot more collaborative with my projects um just you know using using assets that other people created and then like uh one of my games like is actually kind of like kind of open to uh, other dreams creators like if they want to create something for it they can and then like i would add it to the game as i kind of built it which was cool yeah like there's like oh. a uh if, if you go to the dreams website you'll see like a whole like genealogy tab just even on the web mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. this is what this is where this game is used this is what the game is used in this is where this is like remixes of it this is the different assets that it contains it is kind of an ideal kind of like beginner ecosystem. Yeah. For like people that are about art in general, so I'm just curious about, you know, making things. I feel like, you know, it's got pretty much everything you, you would want if you were just coming to it fresh and just wanted to see what you could come up with. Yeah. There's like so much, uh, it feels like the kind of the end point almost of the, um, uh, you know the, the the level editor, right? Like this, this it is this, mm -hmm. not not the endpoint, but like a logistical endpoint for the idea of a level editor. Yeah, it's tools. like yeah, that, that you know, user generated content taking like to its you know at least current logical extreme. Yeah, there's you know, there's still always like, hey, it is still it's a a locked ecosystem, you know, mm -hmm. which is its own thing, but it, you know. You, you you go in there knowing that it is a, a a locked ecosystem right and just like yeah and like you know in my case like i kind of always knew that like i was just showing up to dreams just to see if i could even make anything to begin with right um with with you know the the thought that you know if i can make something here i will then attempt to make something outside of dreams you know, and then, you know, there's, you know, community members that are perfectly content to just spend their creative time in dreams, just making things in dreams. And like, that's, you know, that is their end point. And like, they're content with that. Yeah. But I think, you know, if you want more than that, you know, there, there are options. Like it's not, you can't take dreams with you necessarily, but I think, you know, um, there's, you know, tons of, uh, dreams creators that like you know i look at what they're creating in dreams and i'm like 
this is so com- like this in dreams is complex enough that like, you could easily make something outside of it. Yeah. And it's, it's like, if you put in the work, if you put in the work there, like there's like really like, you know, there's accessibility things and all that. But I think, you know, if, if you want to make something outside of dreams, you 100% can, if you've made something in dreams, right. like I feel like dreams makes it a lot easier, but I think like there's still a complexity level there where, you know, you can like, if you can push through the, the compl- you know, the difficulties of making something in dreams, you can push through the difficulties of making something in unity or Godot or whatever it is right, you choose to build. A lot of those things are also not coming, you know, they come with a lot, with a lot of like baked in tutorials and, Mm-hmm. You know, like asset packs and that kind of thing and and also it's sometimes right. making art is just a hobby uh, and you don't need yeah. uh yeah. you know it's like oh that's fine I, it's fine that i am just like making this purely as a hobby and that it's locked in this yep. thing because i like making you know we don't have to hustle forever not all of our mm-hmm. not uh, not every ounce of our living day has to be monetized you know yeah yeah, and like, and like that's largely where I live too. Just yeah. like I do view this primarily as a hobby. Do I dream about it being more than that? Yes, but like I am content with, you know, where I'm at right now in my journey. And like, if it stays at this level, like cool. If it goes higher than that, awesome. But it's just it's about like finally like you know when I was pursuing acting, when I was pursuing writing, like it was so much more like about where. I could end up right. like I was like, you know, chasing that, chasing that dream really. And like, I feel like with game design, like I finally reached a point where just like, no, I actually really like the process mm-hmm. of this. Like, I don't like, I don't necessarily think I really liked, you know, the process of acting or, you know, pr- your pr- process of just, you know, auditioning constantly or even trying to get auditions. Like that's, you know, the process, like the process of even getting to act, Yes. It was incredibly difficult. Um, you know, I feel like the process of writing was, you know, so just like I'm not really enjoying the process. Like I just I want I, I wanted the end product. And like I feel like with game design, I'm finally at the point where just like process is the thing I love. Like that's what I want to keep doing. It's not like like, pu- you know, putting the game out is great and fun and like what I'm striving for. But ultimately, it's just like I'm just having fun doing this. Yeah, there. It's, it's important to never underestimate the enjoyment of the process. I think that's yeah. how you. That's you know that is part of what's like. You know the question you ask of people sometimes, like, do you want to actually make art or do you want to have had made art? You know, <laughs> right? Yeah, which is like an important question to think about, like why you do something. I mean, yeah. I mean that's part of where like you know. Uh, AI gen stuff comes from. It's like, oh, does this mm-hmm. person, this person just wants to have, have made art. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. And then like the, the actual process of making art is secondary to, I'm an artist. I made art. Um, yeah. Because, uh, because we, as, as we all know, art artist is such a, such a lofty, um, sure. <laughs> such a lofty title. Endlessly yeah. respected. <laughs> Uh, every, as every artist knows when they go to family dinners they go oh the family's like oh you're an artist i'm so glad you have a real job <laughs> and they would never ask any other question of like have you can what, what are you going to fall back on to have you looked at other things and they would never mm-hmm. yeah but um but that is all 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 uh aside the point we are that is uh, art. It's a cool thing. It's doing the process is absolutely vital. Yes. With it. Yeah. Um, because yeah, you you could. It's the part you can control. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't control what people are going to think of it or how they're going to feel about it or you know if you're trying to make a living out it if they're going to buy it. And so of course you know I've got I share that dream. I want to be someone who can make a living making the things I want to make. Right. And I think that's what a lot of creative people want. But at the same time, even if that doesn't happen, it's still there's still a rewarding process that I would not have lost, you know, yeah. whether or not it does well or not. Yeah. Yeah, there is there is right. It doesn't go away if like mm-hmm. you, you spend 
you're like, oh, I enjoyed making this game for uh, all this time, and then I put it out, and then, uh, okay, I got two shares. I'm like, well, exactly. Well, I guess you know it can be it can be easy to be kind of like wrapped up, especially if you spend a lot of time, you know, online. It can be oh, mm -hmm. this person's website is not real anymore. Uh, <laughs> it can be easy to you know you know oh the end goal is I need to I need to be the next viral hit you know I need to be right. uh, the the like in, comparison will kill you. Right, right. I need to, to you know it needs to take off. It needs to be. I need to be the big thing. I I need to be the special person. Um, right. And you'll never, it, it's an impossible thing to compete with, especially once, I mean, it's also easy to forget that 90% of the time you're also competing with advertising dollars that you don't have. Uh, yeah. But it is a sort of uh, uh, broad sort of thing of, hey, why why do you make art? Mm -hmm. uh, and why? If, if, you're a so, if you're a solo or a small team, this is idea where you have this ability for self-expression yes that you know the, the people with the advertising dollars and all you know all that stuff and the you know big trailers and the all that stuff like yeah they have those things but there's something they don't have that we have right which is this uh, this agency yeah the, like... right because we're not compromising on what we want to do you're choosing what you want to do and you're doing it and there's so much like intrinsic value in being able to do that yeah yeah the, the, like there's um uh, where we you know, the making something, making a product will almost inherently, you know, shave off some of the rough edges of something, uh, because you need to be like, you know, when you play test something or make like what, what you think somebody wants something to be. And there is, you know, inherent like, uh, oh, well you lose little, you lose these little touches here and there. And it's always nice to like, I, I like to see small bits of imperfection you know mm -hmm. it's the humanity right right like, you no know, uh, um just yeah like talk about hey so just like i think you just you know society wise have like lost sight of like the human element of art in a lot of ways and i think it's just you know a lot of that is just due to like the again like the level of detail and you know the attempts to simulate uh, reality and realism in you know graphical ways just like you know as uh, industry uh, we've gotten so good at it but at the same time like you lose that human element like it's like as we continue you know that that polish kind of erodes at you know our ability to like recognize that you know these things are made by people yeah and, and just uh, uh, so much of that is also like you see the, and this is not a thing that's just happening in games. It's happening kind of everywhere. The expanding of like, uh, you know, the death of the middle ground and the ever expansion mm -hmm. of the top end, you know? Yeah. Of, you know, there is like, you know, where people, uh, <laughs> I saw, I saw one of the things I saw on, uh, uh twitter.com, <laughs> uh, during my one of my postings of some of the one of the things I was posting, it was a uh, uh, ouch or yeah a contributor of the zine was talking about how she was like uh, I, I don't need a lot having difficulty finding like publishers because she does not need a lot of money <laughs> <laughs> and have getting advice people saying oh you should ask for more money but it's like <laughs> I don't need this money like you know the idea of uh, people. But it, it, as, as, like, things balloon and, like, you know, it happens in film, too, of, like, uh, you know, one for a $100 million movie instead of ten forty $40 million movies and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it sort of, like, happens. All, it's, I feel like it's increasingly happening all around. And that a lot of those, a lot of those, like, works, those more human works are often in that kind of mid-tier, lower tier, you know, the quote-unquote indie uh, uh, mm -hmm. sphere. Which is, you know, yeah. its scope changes constantly, radically. Sometimes, you know, an indie film might have a $10 million budget or whatever. Who knows? 
or you know uh, quote unquote indie so it, right. it's, it's an arbitrary uh, phrase to search down or uh-huh. seek out which is why I uh, avoid it more and more unless I unless mm-hmm. I'm looking for those hot those hot clicks for indie games <laughs> or need to market oneself as an indie game but that's that's um that's uh beside uh, no 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 oh no I'm getting caught on to my uh own verbal tics I'm like oh uh, I think indie is a convenient shorthand yeah. for, you know, so many other things, you know, especially on Twitter where you you don't have that many characters. Indie is a good short word yes. that, that most people take to understand to be, you know, these people are, it's not like millions of dollars here with thousands of people. This is probably somebody's, you know, thing that they had a vision for that they're trying to bring into the world. Yeah, it it gets co-opted a little uh, more recently sure, by sure. by by people with uh, with do that do have millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. So it's like that's why games need more words, you know. <laughs> unless unless really you've got millions of dollars, you're not <laughs> telling us about <laughs> the 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 multi million dollar budget of Crimson Diamond. Oh sure, you know the thing is is. If I even had, like, I don't, but yeah. if I did, I'd still do it this way. Right, you know? right. That, that's so the, nothing would have changed. The, uh, all that would change about my process, you know, if I had millions of dollars, is that um, people would get paid more up front. Because <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, it's like, oh, this is the end the uh the end goal of the thing that i want to make and there is like nothing else to it in particular like money does not make the work better mm-hmm. yeah and or like what would you you know it's you know it's like the how the anecdote started what would you do with the extra money you were given you know he's like i only need this money I, i'm gonna work on it for a year and i need to pay people for a year this is all the money i need yeah but I wonder yeah, if more, so, we'll, we'll so, for sure. No, go on. <laughs> I was gonna say I wonder if I wonder if part of that is like publishers like, well, if we're even if we ten X your sixteen thousand yeah. dollar budget, we're not making yes. that much money. We want to make a lot of money. Yes. Yeah. That's that's what that what that's that's what that is. Yes, because so it's like well uh then it's yeah, it's questions like, Oh, why are you using a text parser? We can't put this on switch if you have a text parser. Yeah, so then the decisions all these decisions get made. Well we we need to make this appeal to the absolute broadest audience. And to do that, like yeah, I mean I would this would not be how this would be going right. if, if trying to appeal to as many people as possible. Definitely not. Um, yeah. And that's you know, that's uh a, a, a folly to seek that because, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you it's it's very hard to appeal broadly. <laughs> yeah, and even when I started making the game in the first place, I wasn't aiming to make a game. I was just kind of like futzing around as a hobby, doing stuff. And there's a yeah. ton of stuff in the game that you don't need f- to be in the game. So if I was scoping this out or pitching this, like none of the stuff would have been would have been in it. And one of the examples is. Um, yeah, you can like sit in just about any of the rooms in the game because I found like in adventure games you can't sit in, in a lot of the rooms and that kind of bothered me. Yeah, right. <laughs> and yeah, it's like stuff like that. Like so, I animated her. You could sit in different places and like the way you can sit, you could say sit sofa or sit couch or whatever. And and so all that stuff, it would completely just make made extra work. And it has nothing to do with the you know the critical path of the game and anything like that. But it's something where I'm like, I want this in there and it's my decision, so it's going to go in there and it has you know. It's a money losing proposition to do yes. this, but that's that's really not what this is about. Right, right. How many how many extra sales does sitting on sitting on a couch exactly? Bring you? And no one's going to want a refund because they can't. You know, like it's just not yeah. going to happen. But it's just you know, oh, you can wash your hands in the sink in the bathroom because I felt like you should be able to do that. Right. But it, that's not. There's no game reason for this. No, it's it's the eccentricities of the things that you would want in a game. That you, yes, you, that's sense. all that is. <laughs> right, and that's kind of like. It's it's what I love about art, you know the the the, the clear eccentricities of the person making them that are like where it does not feel like a a collection of um, you know industry standard decisions wrapped on top of exactly. your own IP. And if it was if that was in the design doc, it would have got cut. I'm pretty sure. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
if if you're if you're trying to make a publisher deadline, um, do how do you need six more animations for sitting on different types of services? Exactly, and I cannot rationalize that. I couldn't even begin to. No, no, but <laughs> the beautiful art is irrational. I don't. The last thing I need in my art is rationality. Great. But uh, but we are. I am. I am. I am watching my thing. We are getting close to approaching two hours of the show, which where is where I like to try and wrap it up. Um, uh, so we are, we are moving into the wrap up phase, uh, which is to say that I'm going to start talking about ending the show, and then it may not end until uh, twenty thirty minutes from now. But this is my mental uh, on switch to say, hey Andrew, uh, wrap it up, buddy. Uh, but before we get into that, do either of you have any, any, any last, last minute pressing statements, questions, or anything you need to, you want to get out as we, as we're closing, as we're closing it down. Just kind of following what you guys were talking about. I just wanted to mention just like, you know, pretty much all of my favorite games, like part of the reason they're my favorite games is because I feel like I got to know the person who made it like yeah. on some like uns like unspoken level, because like, it's not like they told me anything about themselves, but you know, through gameplay, through art, you know, whatever it is, like, y yeah, you want to like, you want to see that person, or you know, and, and and in some way that isn't even necessarily like I, I struggle to think of the words for it because like there aren't yeah. any, and it's kind of like what you're talking about, it's like we need more words, and like part of that is like that relationship between the person interacting with your art and yourself. And like what that looks like and like, you know, we, we, you know, we kind of get to choose, you know, probably not even consciously what that is, but I think just, you know, I, I want to see more of that in games in general and yeah. like, cause it's kind of the main thing I love and it's something that I kind of feel via games that I don't feel on a lot of other art forms, um, at least not in the way that I'm trying to describe here. And I just, yeah, I think it's really special. So, yeah, that that, that reminds me. Of, there's a in in the back of um, the Carmen line, which is a collection of uh, comics from uh, by published by Glacier Bay of where, where's this this guy called uh, Mitsuhashi Kotaro. There's like a, a collection of like I don't know essays or like small write, bits of writings about the the author's work, and one of them is very much of the like reading reading their work it makes me think that i'm trying to, i'm slowly understanding this person i want to read it more to try and understand this person uh to get to know this mm -hmm. person better and there is like uh you know looking at art you see parts of a person in there of like why do why do, you know you ask yourself why do they think about these sorts of things what makes like a person think uh, this sort of way and that is like it is, it is you're right it is very hard to define the way in um which art is kind of how we convey parts of ourselves that we ourselves often would find hard to just explain to a person yeah uh, and, i would also yeah. i'd also say um that what i love about games particularly um especially if you're doing most of the stuff yourself is there's so many different ways to express yourself creatively yeah. with the game through a game. Like it's not just the art, but it's how you animate the art. It's the writing. It's the game design overall. It's a, the music. Every aspect is a different way you can show. Yeah. Different ways to express yourself. And I find that really exciting. Yeah. Right. Like, well, you know, just like no two platformers are all play identically. Uh, so mm -hmm. why, why is this person like, you know, well, these different run speeds or these different jump heights, there's all these little, it's just numbers that a person made and like what draws someone to these numbers or just like trying to understand like somebody's level design or how, how a person chooses to design a space where they put music at all. Uh, yes, it is. It's all Choices. Like, it can get exhausting to be the one deciding those, right. making all those decisions. But when it all comes together to this, yeah, this thing that's more than the sum of its parts, like it's, it's, it's like something that is what makes games such a compelling medium. Right. It's just like we oh. sm smash together every other medium and then you also have to mm -hmm. program it. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and, and um, 
Oh, uh, and yeah, um, building on what what Kinaro said about you know about just the, the the games and everything, I would I would also want to tell people that if you've ever wanted or thought you've ever wanted to make a game and you just you know you've kind of put it off or thought maybe you didn't want to or you can come up with any number of reasons why you wouldn't start i would encourage anyone who's listening to this to go for it and just there's so many amazing tools like dreams adventure game studio so many like especially like um other things like rempy and stuff depending on the kind of game you're trying to make um, there's just there, there's so many tools to make it really easy nowadays to express yourself through games. Of course, you've got Itch.io, you've got other digital platforms. You can share your work and find your community of people who like the same things you like. Yeah. Um, definitely, like, don't let anything stop you. Don't think you can't draw. Like, yeah, like I love that the low res, limited palette artwork, and you can start with that and build from that or stay with that. I'm just gonna stay with the my style probably for indefinitely um you'll get better as you work on it and also don't you know don't compare yourself to real realism and that's not what the games are about it's all about symbolizing ideas in a game um so go for it and just you're gonna you're gonna have a wonderful time yeah there there is like uh if if there is um what you call if there's a game you want to make there's probably even a custom built engine for <laughs> like making that type of game that you can just use as like a basis and like kind of work your like uh uh, uh what's it uh kind of like get, just get get it out there you like get that first like bit mm -hmm. of creativity out of your system and you're like oh i can make a game um i can make one i was uh, ooh, uh, i was or the cursed, the cursed oops, this page can't be found. I, I've come across, I was sorry, Julie, I was looking through your, um, you know, your, your press list or whatever. And I came across oh, yes. those, those cursed. Which one, which one? Cause some this of them don't work Indie anymore. Games plus article. Oh yeah. I don't know where that one, that one is. I, would, I sometimes go, go through them and sometimes they do get lost. Yeah. That, ha um, that happens a lot. I think with, um, uh, just like articles that, or like I, I come across it when I look at people's older games all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it'll just be like oh the, these links are dead <laughs> yeah hopefully most of them are working though yes <laughs> please please okay good um yeah that's, no, that, that's the... <laughs> that that was one because uh, i also came across like oh my God, you you went to the cursed pax east <laughs> in 2020 <laughs> the last big event um yes. in the before times because like i i had i had uh, quote unquote debuted indie apocalypse at that event and when i say that i mean oh. I, someone bought me a pa an exhibitor pass and i kind of mulled around oh trying, nice trying to sell it off of other people's booths um oh awesome well, that was a very strange event <laughs> yeah like there was like this feeling and like subconsciously every yeah. everyone was like there's something a bit not right here because like there's a lot of like your yeah, hand sanitizer and things around but no one was masking because we didn't know what was going on like we every didn't know that if this was a thing yet oh every event was slowly getting canceled yes yeah. that was another thing yeah so it was, it was like one of the weirdest times <laughs> ever yeah. Still I, is. I think like one day it was like oh gdc is canceled the next day it was like uh, there was another event around the exact same time that was canceled e3 maybe uh yeah probably yeah and it just kind of kept uh, trucking along. That was a, a small side tangent of me as I was like closing these tabs um, <laughs> of what a oh, weird yeah. particular sort if, of thing. If anyone, if yeah, let me know if any of the other ones are broken. I don't think I, the Indie Plus one I might not be able to fix because no. it's just something got moved on their site. Right. It could be something got moved, yeah. something or arc, sometimes things get arc, lost in archives. Mm -hmm. Or they could shut down, you know. Yes, yes. I yeah. found a lot of uh, games that uh, are uh, like, oh, look, we've got this covered on the site that no longer exists. Yeah, yeah. It's a strange sort of thing. But anyway, that's that's beside the point. Folks, if, if you can, go out there and, like, if you uh, support your, your local indie site where you can, I <laughs> guess, so they don't disappear. Uh I've definitely seen a a a sea change of like a lot. I go back a decade ago to my indie game list, and there's a lot of like the the tenor of indie game roundup articles has changed very much in like the last decade. Um, like the style of game that winds up on there is has has changed. It's very it's a very interesting thing to see. Uh, as as they go from like a more obscure art 
uh, uh, games and towards more like Steam ready kind of uh, capital VG video games. That doesn't have an end thought to it. That was just me <laughs> saying things are thing. There's an appreciable uh, change in things. But you know what? There's definitely an appreciation. Oh, sorry, what did you say? Oh no, go on. No, no, definitely. Uh, I was, I was, that was me. I was, I was winding up to wrap up. Oh, I see. Okay, well, I will, I will interrupt you briefly. Yeah. Just <laughs> say that. Yeah, I mean, you know, this, this is called indie apocalypse. Well, there was an indie apocalypse. So, yeah. Um. So that's a, a thing that uh, we're now in the post era of. There may be I more of them. I, I, I hear they keep making them. I hear there's mm. more every single day. <laughs> But, uh, uh, yeah, no, the, the name itself is tongue-in-cheek of the idea mm -hmm. of, oh, no, there's too many indie games. We can't make art anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I got bad news for you. Um, there's too much art before video games were ever started. <laughs> Very true. Um, it's, it's more that uh, uh, market shift. But we're not going to get into we're not, At the two-hour mark, we're not going to get into logistics of how markets have shifted um, and, and that sort of thing. But what I'm going to say is, uh, hey, thank you both for being here. We're going to get to the final segment of every good show where people know what that is, and that's where people plug their stuff and we know where to find it. So people will be like, who are these people? How can I find them later? Uh, Kinardo, where can people find your work if they're looking to find your work? Uh, if they're looking to find my work, um, I am uh, Kinardo. I have uh, kinardo.itch.io. Um, the only thing there currently is making the leap. Um, but I do plan, uh, my, my grand scheme uh, is actually to remake basically all of my dreams games uh, and bring them over to PC. So uh, I'm currently working on one of my smaller ones right now that I'm hoping to get out before the end of the year, but we'll see how things go. Right. Um, apart from Itch, um, if you have a PlayStation, if you have dreams, uh, you can check out my games there at Keynardo. Uh, or yeah, just my gamer tag is Keenardo, so you just search me and find my games there. Um, I'm also on Twitter at it's Keenardo. Um, I don't post a whole lot really, but I do occasionally. So if you want to follow me, I'd appreciate it. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. No. Listen, we, the, the, all these ships are sinking all over the place, but you might as well <laughs> wave to each other as a ship sinks. <laughs> uh, Julia. We, where can people find your work should mm -hmm. they want to find it? Okay. Um, if you want to find, so I've got uh, Julia Minamata.com. You can find like that's links to but projects, other projects I've worked on besides the Crimson Diamond, but there's also the Crimson Diamond.com. You can find all my social media links. I am on Twitter. I am on Blue Sky, Mastodon. There's a Facebook page for the Crimson Diamond. Um, all, yeah, all that good stuff. I have a YouTube where I put my videos of my live streams. I live stream every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, game development, like art development, and if my if my musician's on, we will sometimes compose a track together. Um, no spoilers for the actual story part of the game that isn't already in the demo. So don't worry about um, getting anything, any aspect of the game spoiled. So we, we do that once a week. And um, if you want, um, yeah, my um, the demo is available on Steam, um, Fireflower Games, and Itch.io. Um, um, for I'm planning on launching this year, which I'm really excited about. And you, you can um, wishlist the game on Steam would be a real help because it helps with store visibility when you uh, when you eventually launch. So yeah, please check it out on Steam wishlist. Um, I have a Crimson Gazette that I just put out to the March issue of yesterday, and uh, you can find like a way to subscribe to that on crim the Crimson Diamond .com. Gosh. Yes, think, yes, I no. Is that all? Is that all? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I ask myself that question often. Like, do I, did I hit all of my, my things? You've got, you know, Irish, a lot of fire. I went to go wishlist it. You know, Julia already had done it. Yeah. So, uh, we, we mentioned the pre show that I had probably already, you know, you know, you, when you, when you sprung the, the indie apocalypse marketing question onto me. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I was not prepared for this shoe to be on my foot. <laughs> but. <laughs> But yeah, no. So it has been like a th you've probably seen it kicking around for a while, and you know when things kick around for a while, eventually they come out, and it is coming out. Yes, this year. Um, but yes, uh, all these things for, for now, wish lists are helpful until until suddenly they're not. <laughs> you know. 
it's all we have to go on. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We're like this is. Yeah, make sure to put make sure to put a link in in the second tweet until you don't do that until that's the bad advice until oh yeah 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 that's what i'm up to right now like, that's my current state of protocol for right. twitter your your belief Ugh. you're like whatever i'll we let we put whatever. our candles yeah. in our and we lay out our candles and we we try to appease whatever algorithmic uh, uh rituals we need to go through exactly if there's like a combination of emojis I need to put in every tweet that yes. would help, I would just let me know what those are now, please. Yes, I, I do see people post a lot of emojis, and I go, "Do these people help? Does this help people connect with their tweets better?" <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, I, I is you know, the algorithm is is a is a cruel is a cruel taskmaster. <laughs> but do I prefer it to sites without algorithms, where the where the algorithm you're appealing to is power users to pay attention to your work i don't know i don't think either are truly preferable to me well that's why we have to do everything which is why yes. i asked you the marketing question because i'm begging you to tell me where i can stop marketing myself yes oh i think the answer julia bad news i think the answer is you have to keep <laughs> doing it everywhere <laughs> you know what i would say don't do threads maybe threads is great maybe it isn't i can't stand the site it's it is yeah i'm not yeah i'm not on that one it is not so okay. um, <laughs> like it is it is it is feel like People joke about internet brain rot, but I Thread seems like it's like, oh no, internet brain rot is real, <laughs> and everyone on Threads has it. Uh, but, uh, but that said, um, speaking of people with a million things that they need to remember that they have, um, Indie Apocalypse, I think it's cool. I think you ought to get it. If you're listening live, it is, um, or the Monday after through uh, a Patreon, which I'll mention later. Um, um, uh, I believe there's a ongoing Steam, or not Steam, an ongoing, uh, put all these things on Steam. No, thank you. That's like $2,500 or something. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an ongoing itch sale where you can get it at the lowest possible rate, which is like $10. Uh, and you can buying that gets people like Kinato here of like six or seven bucks somewhere down the road that the the vaunted Indiepocalypse six dollar royalty payouts that occasionally trickle through. Um, you can get that there indiepocalypse dot com. I just have that. It's my own damn website. You can get it there. Um, indiepocalypse dot com slash you know what slash Patreon. I mentioned that earlier. You can get it there if you want to just get a regular subscription or. The big, the big push is like uh, do for the size uh, for for only five dollars a month or fifty a year, I believe. You can get just the newly commissioned games from Indie Apocalypse. If you want, like, uh, to be part of like, I want to uh, for five bucks a month, I get a brand new game every month. That's a cool thing to do. And then you can, I think I even have it so that you get a coupon. So if you want to get the rest of it later, you can get the rest of the zines for cheaper. I don't remember if that's a real thing or not. I think it is. I don't remember if I did that. And if I did, I forgot to update it for like a year. Whoops. Um, um, if you would like to join, of course, IndiePocalypse.com slash submit is just an itch jam page that is always open, uh, as, you know, give or take a few hours every single month as I transition between the two pages that you just, if you've got a game, you just add it to the, get, add it to the list. And then I play it and sometimes I go, yes, sometimes I go, no, um, that's just life. Um, and also, uh, you know, whether, whether you're not get, you do or do not get into pockets is irrespective of the quality of the game. It's, I, I have my own vibes and especially as I'm doing more projects that are coming in later, I'm going to mention in a second, I am skewing more towards like hand picking more indie apocalypse games, really getting like truly making indie apocalypse for like absolute sickos who just want weird ass games and games that are like skewing more into the the avant-garde and just like the fringes of what game development is then that's because you know if you want to get physical editions of indie apocalypse of course you go to indiepocalypse.com slash tapes i've got them there if you want your own game on this handy diy uh cassette case usb format you just go to pizzabranks.com slash tape market um, you can buy games up there now. I've got a, I've, I've got a good like ten, ten or twelve games available up there. If you want to buy, if you want to have your own games printed, whether whether you sell them through my store or not, or whether you're just buying tape runs for you to sell on your own, 
Um, you can do that at also at indiepocalypse.com slash tape market. They're basically printed at cost because I think the format is neat and I want people to do it. It's the it's the zine. It's a low it's a it's a low risk, low investment zine format, print a, printing music on C D format, but for games. Um, also uh, pizzaprings.com slash tape club is the monthly tape club that I'm putting out brand new games. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's what it, it's what it says on the tin. It's a monthly tape club of you get a game every month and it is me swinging around the highest profile stuff I can get. That's like, I have mentally have my tiers of stuff I'm supporting, I guess, as a publisher of games. I don't have time to describe all that. Anyway, I think that's it. I think that's all of my links and URLs. Um, I'm online as Pizza Pranks in Places. Um, that's my my internet handle that I that I decide, that I use because uh, it's got good SEO, <laughs> um, more or less. But I think that's it. I think that's I don't have anything else. That's my show. Kinara uh, Julia, thank you both for joining me. Thank you for thank you. Uh, hang, hanging out a, 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 a treat to talk to you both a treat to you know as someone who is uh, decidedly not attending GDC next week um, <laughs> this this show is my version of like what if we all just stayed at home but we could still hang out and network and by, I love it and by network yeah. I mean just chat with each other and mm-hmm. become aware of each other I'm a big proponent of the the uh, uh, the you know professional peer relationship of person you wave to at a convention as you see each other on the convention circuit and that is you're like oh yes we know each other hello <laughs> goodbye yeah. um, that's how networking is supposed to work or is supposed to be yes uh yeah. we it turns out we are not it turns out we are human beings not collect not uh transactional uh uh, uh professional relationships <laughs> or something yeah yeah um, that's that's what I like to think. But anyway, that's the end of the show. We're closing it down. A final thank you. You know what? I I think I forgot these last couple of weeks. Hey, thank you for listening. If you're listening out there, I uh, I often wonder about the show. I think, hey, it's real fun to do. I don't know how it is to listen to, but I enjoy doing it a lot. And if you like listening to it, hey, thanks. Um, uh, Indie Apocalypse not being being not only the first place where a lot of developers get published or pay, or sometimes worse, the first place to get paid, but also, Hey, Indie Apocalypse Radio, first place where a lot of developers get onto like uh, podcasts or interviews or that sort of thing. Um, trying to uh, bust it open and uh, keep it more, keep, keep the space less, uh, feel uh, less unapproachable, I guess. Thank you for making the space too. Like yes. putting this all together, that's a lot. It's time and effort and attention, and yeah, it's it's nice to have spaces like this, Thank and you. They're, I, they're needed. Thanks. I, I yeah. don't I don't know how to not do it anymore. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, it's one of those uh, curse experiences, but I will I will, uh, I'm, I try a new thing where I don't deflect compliments. <laughs> Good. <laughs> what if Good. I What if I said thank you? And then did not to be uh, belittle myself immediately afterwards. Just, um, I only half did at that time, <laughs> but no, thank you. It's a bit a process. It's a process. Yeah, thank yeah. you. It's uh, um, it, it's, it's it's a true. Uh, um, I like I like games. <laughs> it's why I do it. Um, Ditto. Um, mm-hmm. But before I get more sentimental, I'm gonna shut down the show. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.